Welcome everybody. I'm glad that you're joining us for this lunchtime CE presentation. Um, I want to start by letting everybody know that this event is funded, at least in part, by student fees which were appropriated and dispersed by the undergraduate student government at UNC Chapel Hill. So we're very grateful for their support. Um, and this is part of the HGAPS speaker series. So hopefully if you haven't joined other talks, um, you will in the future. Um, HGAPS stands for Helping Giveaway Psychological Science. Um, and that's part of what we're aiming to do today. So we have a treat in store for us. Um, today, Dr. Emily becker Haynes will be presenting. Um, she's an assistant professor of psychiatry at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania and in the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. She's also the clinical director of the Pediatric Anxiety Treatment Center at Hall Mercer, which is part of the University of Pennsylvania Health System. Her talk today is called Considerations for Optimizing Delivery of Exposure Therapy for Youth with Complex Comorbidities. Um, and I'm really looking forward to what she has to say. So thank you, Emily. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here and talk about my absolutely favorite thing, which is exposure therapy. My caveat is that I'm getting over a cold. So if I sound like I'm hacking up a lung, be grateful this is virtual and not in person and just bear with me. Um, so in addition to some of the acknowledgements that Anna shared earlier before I dive in, I also want to just um, be clear and note that a lot of the content I'll be developing today has been co-created in collaboration with Dr. Hannah Frank, who is currently finishing up her postdoc at Brown and will be transitioning to faculty there. So I do not take at all credit for a lot of the information I'll be presenting here independently. So I have a very um, ambitious agenda for our hour together and I'm going to do my best to get through it and still save some time for questions at the end. Um, and also if questions come up as I'm talking, please feel free to pop things in the chat and whatever we don't get to during the hour today, I will try to follow up by email or um, other means of communication after the fact. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and dive in and just get us all on the same page with some brief background about exposure and then dive into some considerations for how we adapt and tailor exposures when kids also have other complex presentations. So in terms of just basic definitions, when we think about exposure therapy, there's a little bit of a contrast between what we often think about therapy being in sort of the vernacular, we all go to school and become providers because we wanna make people feel better, but that's absolutely not what we're doing within the context of exposure therapy. What we are doing is going out and helping people gradually face the things that they're afraid of, whether that's people, objects, places, or internal sensations in a supported way. And what we wanna help kids do within the context of exposure therapy is teach kids to learn that they can tolerate their fear and teach their brains and bodies that they may be safe in situations where they feel that they are not safe currently and that they may be avoiding. So I love exposure therapy. I do it all day, every day. Um, and uh, one of the things that I love about it is it's incredibly effective. So uh, basically every um, intervention, psychosocial intervention that we have developed in the literature for kids, exposure-based cognitive behavioral therapy really is one that kind of stands above in terms of the level of evidentiary support and its ability to help kids achieve symptom relief. But it's also um, the least used evidence-based intervention in routine clinical care for a lot of different reasons, um, not small ones being that exposure is very stressful for clinicians to do, and it can be stressful to intentionally induce distress in our clients with the long-term goal of helping them to learn that they can tolerate and manage their difficult emotions. So while there are significant research to practice gaps for many evidence-based practices in presenting problems, um, exposure really does lag behind that of other interventions. It's often considered to have a public relations problem with many clinicians expressing concern that by inducing distress intentionally amongst the youth we work with, that exposure violates principles of doing no harm and is therefore unethical. And estimates suggest it's the least used evidence-based intervention strategy in routine clinical care. And it's also been rated as the most difficult strategy to implement in community settings. And even after clinicians undergo rigorous training in cognitive behavioral therapy, only about a third of clinicians report regularly using exposure therapy 
with their anxious clients. And again, there's a lot of reasons for this, but one of the um, big ones that we, I think we're increasingly paying better attention to is that we, we don't have great guidance for how we really should be effectively delivering exposure therapy, especially when kids have anxiety amongst a number of other comorbidities. And so despite the many calls for improving rates of exposure therapy, we really need to sort of open the black box and really understand what goes into exposure processes to better help kids. We really need sort of some practical guidance and practice-based evidence to really understand how we can better support clinicians to deliver exposures to complex clients. So there are some core principles associated with the difficulty of delivering exposures that are gonna guide the talk that I'll give today. So first, um, we know that exposure is complex. So we think it's important to try to break down the process of exposure therapy and make it as easy as possible to support clinicians to deliver this intervention regardless of whether the, a child has sort of a pure classic anxiety disorder or a more complex presentation. Second, we wanna acknowledge that we as a field don't always do a great job of recognizing that it can be really, really hard to deliver high quality evidence-based treatment, especially exposure, outside of specialty and high resource settings. And third, we need to be really open and transparent that there are limitations in the treatment literature about knowing exactly for whom and at what points in treatment exposure should be used to be most effective. So to address the first point, we're going to um, try to distill the complexity of exposure into a five-part model that can be used as a distinct intervention in tandem with other um, intervention techniques. And to the second point, we'll explicitly discuss and acknowledge the comor that comorbidities can and will impact exposure treatment. And finally, what I hope you'll take away from this is some practice-based clinical guidance about how we can begin to approach exposure for complex cases. So to give you an overview of sort of the five steps of exposure, first we will propose that, or I'll propose a solid case conceptualization is really critical to understand who and how youth, so turn who and which youth will ideally benefit from exposure. And then we'll break the process of exposure into four distinct steps that are interrelated and not necessarily linear, but psychoeducation, assessment and hierarchy building, individualized practice, and homework and relapse prevention. So again, this is not necessarily a, a linear process and each part is likely to be continuously revisited throughout treatment. But we can think of these as sort of the five distinct stages of the exposure process. So over the next 15 minutes, I'm gonna briefly review each of the five steps and then I'll talk a little bit more about how this can play out when there are complex comorbidities at play. So let's start uh, with conceptualization. <laughs> Excuse me. So um, there's a growing literature devoted to the importance and practice of science-informed case conceptualization that I do not have time to cover here, but briefly, accurate detection of target problems is intended to present a really clear roadmap for evidence-based psychosocial treatment. And there's really nowhere else that this is more clear when it, than when it comes to anxiety or obsessive compulsive disorder. And if you're relatively immersed in the exposure space, you may have heard the maxim, right? If somebody has anxiety or OCD, we should do exposures, right? So there's sort of a very clear roadmap there. And that's for really good reason. So here on this slide are multiple, the multiple ways that anxiety or related disorders can present that we have very good evidence that exposure can be very successful at ameliorating symptoms. So when youth present with one or more of these conditions, we have very good reason to believe that exposure should be at the forefront of our treatment plans. But of course, sometimes this isn't so straightforward because these disorders or symptoms can occur often in the context of other comorbidities. And while this doesn't negate the potential for exposure to be helpful, it does make it trickier or it can make it trickier. So we'll circle back to this in a little bit. Okay, so just again, to move through the basic five steps of exposure before we talk about adapting, because we have to understand the sort of core principles before we can think about tailoring for different complicated presentations. Just very briefly, um, we'll talk about some of the uh, traditional exposure models for more classic anxiety, and then talk about how to adjust and conceptualize approaches in more complex presentations. So we could spend a whole hour talking about how to optimize psychoeducation for exposure therapy and facilitate buy-in among children and their parents, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that right now. Um, but what I will do is show some slides that I'm happy to share 
um, the, that are really good for telehealth, actually, for explaining the cycle of avoidance and why exposure therapy is important. But we do want to make sure that kids and parents understand that our goal is not to torture them by doing things that are scary and hard, but that instead there's a very clear reason of how we think anxiety disorders are maintained over time. That is the reason we think exposure therapy can be successful. So we'll often sort of draw graphs with kids um, at the first session and sort of explain what we think happens when anxiety starts to go a little bit haywire and becomes oversensitive and starts causing a lot of distress. Um, I like to personally use an example of being afraid of a spider or having a spider phobia because it's pretty clear most kids and parents can relate to the idea of being afraid of a bug. Right, is that if I go into my office and there is a daddy long legs in my office um, and I see it on my desk, my anxiety is going to shoot up and I'm going to really want to try to get away from that spider as fast as possible because my anxiety alarm is yelling that I'm in danger and I need to stay safe. So I engage in some type of avoidance behavior or an OCD. This can manifest as a compulsion. Um, and then by doing so, this will provide me with some quick relief. I'll feel better because I'm not near that horrible, scary looking daddy long legs. And I get negatively reinforced for avoiding that spider. But the problem is I need to go back to my office and continue to do work. And my anxiety brain can be a little bit of a butthead and remembers that spider as being much scarier and bigger and meaner than maybe it even actually is. So my anxiety is gonna shoot up again and I'm gonna wanna leave again. And that this is how we get caught. This is how anxiety tries to help us, but accidentally makes our worlds very small and keeps us from doing a lot of things we might otherwise be able to enjoy by getting caught in what we call a cycle of avoidance. And there's lots of different ways that we can explain this to kids, but again, understanding the principles of what maintains anxiety is really important for understanding how to then tailor it for kids with different presentations, because then we what we want to help kids and families understand, right, is that one of the best ways we can help break up this cycle of avoidance is slowly, in a supported way, learning to face our fears. And that if we go and we stay in the office and maybe even let that daddy long legs eventually crawl up your arm, that instead of avoiding, we stayed, that our anxiety isn't just going to go up and up to a point that we're not going to be able to tolerate it. Now, again, we're not talking about a poisonous tarantula that could theoretically kill you. This is a daddy long legs. It's a safe, objectively safe situation. We'll talk about that in a little bit about how that can, when it's unclear that that can cause challenges. But if I stay in this situation and nothing bad eventually happens, my anxiety will come down on its own because I will learn that what I was afraid of did not actually come true. And this natural reduction of anxiety is something that we call habituation. And I always tell kids and parents, it doesn't really look this pretty. It's usually very messy. Anxiety goes up and down throughout the process. But if we continue to face our fears and flex our brave muscles, over time, our anxiety doesn't go up as high and starts to come down quicker and becomes much more manageable and at a tolerable level. So again, this is psychoeducation in a nutshell. And the goal within the psychoeducation phase, though, ultimately is to figure, is to explain this process to kids and parents, get them to understand and buy into the process of exposure therapy and understand why and how it can be helpful to start facing fears to ultimately be able to get symptom relief from anxiety or OCD symptoms. In the second phase, or the th really the third phase of exposure practice, we talk about assessment and hierarchy building. And again, um, with the assessment and hierarchy phase, we're really learning more about the specific situations or core fears that individual children have that are leading to their avoidance behaviors and causing distress. And what it's our job as a therapist is to try to break up those situations or fears into small steps in a manageable way and help kids over time gradually increase the, the things that they're able to do and really flex their brave muscles to be able to improve their um, rates of approach behaviors, learn the things that they're afraid of are not necessarily coming true and gradually gain more mastery and control and agency over their anxiety alarms. Uh, so one of the things that um, sort of traditionally we might do in a fear, fear ladder or hierarchy, right, is really try to create things in a very structured order um, and then just basically move up the hierarchy. There's a lot of evidence from the past few years to suggest that we don't really need to rigidly adhere to a hierarchy in that way to guide practice. But what's really critical in the context of this assessment phase of exposure practice is to really drill down and make sure you understand what the core fears are. Sometimes this is called a core belief, depending on sort of how you're trained and who your um, CBT supervisors are. But in general, we need to understand what 
the child is afraid of and how that's driving the avoidance behaviors. And so when we wanna do, we wanna make sure that we're getting information from a lot of different sources and opportunities. This isn't just something you get in an intake and move on from, but continuously getting information by observing what the child is doing in the context of different feared situations, getting information from kids and parents, asking a lot of comparison questions. Like some kids are afraid that if they go out in public, they'll feel really embarrassed and they won't be able to handle the feeling in their bodies. Other kids are really worried they'll fall on their face and that someone will laugh at them and that's the worst thing that could possibly happen. Or, you know, which one sounds more like you? And really we wanna understand specifically as deep down using sort of downward arrow techniques, what the ultimate fear is. Is it fear of death? Is it fear of harming somebody else? Is it a fear that, you know, failure will lead to being kicked out of their home and never being a success or not being able to make money and support their family, whatever it may be, this is very individualized and is understanding this is critical to then being able to tailor the exposure practices depending on what the individual child's presentation is. And the other tricky piece here, of course, is this is again an ongoing process because poor fears can evolve over the course of treatment. So this is something that needs to be continuously revisited. <coughs> um, in our work with clinicians, we've learned that hierarchy generation, you know, those different ideas, breaking things down into smaller steps can be really difficult, especially if you don't have sort of a close collaboration with other team members or supervisors who can help you generate the different ideas that could be placed on a hierarchy for most common core fears. So we have actually developed a resource to help clinicians do that. It's free online at bravepracticeforkids.com. You can create an account that doesn't cost any money and you can look across five different domains of anxiety presentation and um, what will be on there are these different challenge cards of just exposure ideas for things like social anxiety or generalized anxiety that you can like print and just bring into a session and have kids rate to start how you know how hard each one might be for them on a 10 point scale or 100 point scale to be able to at least start that process of hierarchy generation and support um, brainstorming ideas for other exposures that could potentially be helpful for that child. Um, and again, of course, one of the themes is that things change and you want to continue to revisit things in a nonlinear fashion and that the hierarchy is really a living document and it can definitely change and move over time just as core fears can evolve and what, become, what is hard one day might not be hard the next day and so being continuously open about revisiting your understanding of the sort of uh, variability in situations that kids are avoiding and what would be easier or harder for them to do is really important to success of the assessment phase. And so once then we have good buy-in from youth and families and have a good sense of the core fears and what types of situations are easier or harder for kids, the next steps are the actual exposure or practice itself or what we refer to here as individualized practice. And there are multiple forms that exposures can take. So uh, when we do trainings, we often talk about it as being three and a half types of exposures. The first is imaginal, right, where fear stimuli are imagined or scripted out. These are most commonly used to either conduct very low level exposures, like if it's too hard to look at a spider in real life or look at a picture of a spider, we might start with just imagining a picture of a spider. The other way that imaginals are often used is actually almost at the very top or higher end of the hierarchy um, or exposures to stimuli that are difficult or potentially even unethical to replicate in real life, right? So the fear of someone breaking into your house or fear of going to hell. Um, scripting or imaginal exposures are very common in OCD and can be very stressful and challenging for patients who are often at the top of the hierarchy, but to imagine feared outcomes coming true, um, you know, allowing the idea that certain taboo thoughts could actually potentially be real, um, imagining that you've gone to hell, all those types of things. So um, they're a very powerful tool, the imaginal exposures, but tend to bookend the ends of the hierarchy, at least in, in my experience. And then the second type of exposure are the in vivo or situational exposures. They're probably the most common and the ones we want people to be doing most often because this is getting out and doing things that kids are afraid of, helping them learning to boss back their anxiety in the moment. And then the interoceptive or sensational exposure exposures were really initially drawn from the panic disorder literature, but increasingly are used more broadly 
for kids with anxiety, and these involve intentionally bringing on the physical symptoms of anxiety to help kids learn to tolerate those physical symptoms and reduce avoidance of those physical symptoms. And finally, the last one I have up here is exposure with response prevention or ERP. Um, ERP is most commonly associated with the OCD treatment literature refers to the notion that, you know, you would engage in some sort of exposure to a stimuli um, related to an intrusive thought and then work to prevent engaging in compulsive responses or rituals. Um, however, since non-OCD anxiety is most often associated with avoidance behaviors, um, we can think about really all exposure as exposure with prov response prevention because we're trying to help kids face their fears and then not engage in avoidance behaviors. So really, I think of exposure and ERP as just one and the same thing. And again, we could do a whole other talk. And typically, if I do exposure training, like you're coming at with me for 12 hours, and we're just getting tip of the iceberg. So this is like in two minutes, the step by step process that you might use to execute, execute an exposure. Some of the basic steps, obviously, there's lots of variability with how you might um, execute an exposure, but the basic things that you want to hit an exposure session are reviewing a fear hierarchy, collaboratively setting a task with, that you're going to choose to do for in-session practice, eliciting from the client what they're afraid will happen if they complete the selected exposure, identify the goal of the exposure, including potentially minimizing any safety behaviors or rituals or compulsions, and then you'll go ahead and encourage the child to engage in some sort of approach behavior and assess their anxiety ratings before and throughout the exposure, mostly to make sure that they're paying attention to what it is that you're doing. Because if you're thinking that it's supposed to be really stressful, but their SUDS ratings are like a two out of 10, they might be doing something in their head or covering their eyes or something that's keeping them from fully engaging and immersing in the task. And then as the clinician, you're going to continue to sort of gradually adjust and titrate the exposure difficulty as needed to help them maintain their focus so it's not completely overwhelming, but it's also not too easy. And when the exposure is done, we want to engage in what we call post-processing, asking whether the client met their goals, how did the experience compare to what they feared would happen, um, did their anxiety go as high as they expected to, did their feared outcome come true, were they able to tolerate, were they able to cope with it, ultimately you want to help facilitate um, conclusions about, you know, was there something we could learn about what happened compared to what we expected, because that's where we think a lot of the symptom change is going to take place. Um, and so, and then of course, we want to make sure that we're assigning an at-home exposure task that kind of aligns potentially with what we did in session so that the child can practice and continue to work on reaching their goals in between sessions and not just during the session itself. Which leads very nicely into the sort of the last component of the five-step exposure model, which is homework and relapse prevention. So as many of you probably know, home practice is a critical component of most evidence-based treatments, but in exposure therapy in particular, it's uniquely associated with improved outcomes. Um, and while conducting exposure practice in sessions is important, it's likely insufficient for skills to generalize to the places outside of the sessions where they matter most for kids, and also is important for supporting maintenance of gains after treatments concluded. We don't want kids only facing their fears because we as the therapist told them to do it. We want them to start doing that independently as well and also supporting parents and caregivers to help kids face their fears. So supporting kids to engage in intentional exposure practice between sessions is really critical, a really critical component for effective delivery of exposures. And then finally, throughout treatment, but especially as we start to see kids making improvements, we want to continuously support kids to think about how to maintain their gains long term, um, either as treatment's continuing or after treatment ends. Um, it's really helpful to normalize for kids that anxiety can be really chronic and the fact that they should expect that their anxiety may have ups and downs. Um, and that's not always indicative that treatment hasn't worked or that their skills aren't working. So we really do want to help prepare uh, clients throughout all phases, but especially as we're nearing the end of exposure treatments, um, for the fact that anxiety could and likely will rise again in the future, and then help them prepare for how they can manage that anxiety. So I sometimes do what I call like disaster drills with kids where I'm like, tell me every worst case scenario that could possibly happen over the next six months you can think of. And then like you tell me how you can use what we've talked about in treatment to, to address what comes up for you to sort of really instill that self-efficacy and belief that clients can and 
um, are able to manage anxiety as it comes. And then importantly, we also want to help clients learn to embrace an exposure lifestyle or a lifestyle of approach behaviors and emphasize the importance of continuing to practice and engaging in exposures on their own to manage anxiety in the future. I often use a metaphor of like, if you train for a marathon, you can run 26 miles, but if you're like, that was great, I'm, I'm in shape now and then never run again, like you're not going to be able to continue to maintain the gains that you've made physically if you don't continue to work the muscles and that bravery just like legs and arms can, can, is a, can be thought of like a muscle that needs to be continuously flexed for gains to be maintained. And of course, you want to make sure that we celebrate and help youth to recognize their successes. Okay, so that was a very high level overview of what traditional exposure would look like. And it's like, great, that sounds awesome. Like now I know how to do exposures with kids. You told me if they have anxiety or OCD, we should do exposure. What's the problem? But truly for many of you, if you're here, maybe you've likely experienced this, right? It's often much more complicated and tricky than that because our general roadmap of if you have anxiety or OCD, you should do exposure doesn't really map onto many of the kids that may come into clinical practice, right? So we need to think about what about when it occurs with a number of either comorbid mental health disorders or environmental or contextual stressors that may complicate or potentially at times even contraindicate the use of exposure therapy. So what do we do then? And truthfully, the, the empirical literature gives very little guidance. Um, and we've done actually, we have two systematic reviews looking at the treatment of OCD for kids in the context of co-occurring psychosis or when they have substantial trauma histories. And there's like two studies on psychosis and OCD works with exposure therapy, none in children to know whether or not it can be potentially beneficial despite the fact that 20% of individuals with psychosis also have symptoms of OCD. And then in our review of um, youth with trauma histories, there is absolutely no treatment literature about how you should adapt, tailor, or even do OCD treatment when youth have substantial trauma histories and potentially co-occurring PTSD. So we're left to really use um, theoretical or, or uh, theoretical and practice-based research evidence here to really guide a lot of what we talk about on the next couple of slides. So I wanna be open about that. There are things that we're generating and deriving from published literature, but in many ways, this next couple of slides, the caveat is it's really practice-based and theoretically driven, not necessarily formally evidence-based. But I digress. And really what I want us to move away from is the idea of if we have anxiety or OCD, we should do exposure to a yes and that yes, if there is anxiety and OCD, we should do exposure. And we need to think about when exposure should be deferred or contraindicated. And we need to start thinking really carefully and thoughtfully about how we sequence or augment exposures within the context of other evidence-based practices when there are complex comorbidities, especially for kids who otherwise fall through the cracks of the system, kids, for example, kids who have high rates of trauma exposure or experiencing racial stress or have other marginalized or minoritized identities that are not necessarily reflected in our clinical trials data that we draw from most generally. So this is really complicated stuff. I will say first and foremost, clinical judgment does end up being key in many of these scenarios. Um, there is also really robust evidence that exposures can be emotionally draining for therapists and that even for clinicians with the best of intentions, exposures get short shrift. In other words, they're very easy for clinicians to avoid doing. Um, and we tend to sort of default to the idea like, well, it's easier to do something else or maybe we shouldn't do exposure. But that risks doing children an injustice when they may benefit truly from the powerful effects of exposure. So to ensure that youth who can benefit do receive it, um, we propose there's some guiding questions and principles that you can use to guide in your work with youth. So one of the simplest ways that we, I like to think about this is to work backwards from what exposure is doing, which is supporting adaptive approach behaviors. So we wanna think about what if any treatment targets or areas of impairment there are that could benefit from exposure. So if we focus less on diagnosis, but more on what type of avoidance behaviors youth are engaging in that are leading into some type of impairment, this can help us identify treatment targets for exposure. 
And it's really important when we're thinking in this way that we need to be thinking about maladaptive avoidance, not avoidance that is functionally adaptive or helpful. So for example, a child who's afraid to go to their nearby park in their neighborhood because of fear of gang activities, when, there is, when it is in fact a hot spot for gang activity, that's not something appropriate to target within the context of exposure therapy. So, um, but instead if a kid's living in a suburban area and it's a pretty safe park and all the kids are going there all the time and the child has the fear that something bad could happen in the park, that's a different story, right? So there's a lot of gray areas in thinking and collaborative collateral information that we need to be relying on here to determine whether something constitutes maladaptive avoidance that we would target through exposure or adaptive or helpful avoidance that we either might not um, address directly or address with other strategies. And when we're trying to identify potential treatment targets that are avoidance-based, we um, want to make sure to remember that avoidance can take multiple forms, right? Kids can avoid people, they can avoid objects, they can avoid places, they can avoid different ways that they feel in their bodies or different, or different thoughts or worries in their minds. And we also need to attend, especially with children, to accommodation, which is a special case of avoidance because it's most observed within loved ones, not the child himself, um, as the loved ones may engage in various behaviors like providing reassurance or changing daily routines to help prevent kids from experiencing anxiety and is in of itself often an important treatment target within the context of exposures. Um, I'll put in a plug. Uh, if you haven't, it's a, a little bit a little bit dense, but it's a great read. Um, Michelle Krask has a new paper just out on, it's called like the Optex Nexus, um, talking about sort of the underlying inhibitory retrieval and learning theory that guides exposures and is really helpful to think about this question of what you might target within the context of exposure and how you want to be facilitating some sort of learning about something that may, someone's um, engaging with maladaptive avoidance about. So if you haven't read it yet, I encourage you to take some time to read that over. It's, it takes some time, but it's worth putting in the effort to sort of read it in depth. Okay, so then let's assume we have a, um, identified that there are some avoidance-based targets that could potentially benefit from exposure. This in and of itself doesn't necessarily mean that diving into exposure right away may be the best fit for a more complex youth. So We'll add a couple few key considerations to address that question raised earlier, right? How do we think about when to defer or not do exposure at all or sequence for a given treatment target? So the first thing I think could be really helpful to think about are these idea of a case conceptualization driven deferral, right? So this is based on our understanding of the child and their presentation. We think exposure could potentially be helpful, but we need to do some other things first before the child's gonna be really ready for exposure therapy. So there are just some examples on the slide here that, um, can help, like our, that may fall into this bucket of something where we would defer exposure and like sort of sequence it after other evidence-based treatment techniques. So for example, if a child is presenting with both depression and anxiety and the depression seems pretty primary, we might start with behavioral activation before moving into the exposure phase of treatment. If the child is experiencing significant instability in the home, whether it be within the family unit or you know, lack of housing or homelessness, you know, getting the family connected to case management services or doing direct case management work is going to be required and probably necessary for any subsequent exposure therapy to be helpful. Um, if individuals have very significant suicidality or non-suicidal self-injury, we want to think about safety planning and potentially strategies from dialectical behavioral therapy before we would move into formal exposure practice. And then there's, of course, times where the symptoms are unclear, right, where it's not clear based on the initial assessment that whether a child may be experiencing OCD or something more consistent with a psychotic disorder. So we might not rush to do exposure, but instead do some additional assessment, get consultation from an expert, um, potentially in psychosis or whatever the concern questioning symptoms are before we would move forward with exposure. It can also be helpful to um, ask yourself when you're trying to think like, do I do exposure now or do I defer this in favor of another intervention is to also from a shared decision-making perspective, right? With the family is what's the primary reason for seeking treatment? Are they seeking treatment because the avoidance behaviors identified are the primary concern? And if the answer is no, and there are clearly other pressing treatment targets, deferral of exposure could be indicated. Um, and in contrast to deferrals, there's also 
what we would call case conceptualization driven contraindications. So these are times when even though there may be avoidance that's causing distress, we want to be really careful and potentially not treat that avoidance with exposure at all. I would say these, these possible contraindications are really tricky. They often fall into a gray area and can be difficult to decide independently. And these are areas where consultate, peer consultation or supervision or even expert consultation can be really helpful when it's not clear if exposure is indicated or not for a given treatment target. So for example, if somebody is having co-occurring intrusive thoughts of self-harm alongside active suicidal ideation, we're typically not gonna do exposures to those thoughts of self-harm, right? It doesn't mean we might not do exposures to other OCD symptoms, but we're not gonna do suicide-related exposures when somebody has active suicidal ideation because it's too much, it's too risky for that child. And it's not uncommon given the rates of co-occurring depression within OCD. Um, if you're not clear, if somebody's having intrusive thoughts, and I, I've had clients like this where it's not always clear, you know, are they having intrusive thoughts related to their sexual identity or are, are they questioning their own sexual or gender identity? And if we're not clear, we don't want to do, we want to be very careful or thoughtful about doing exposures if somebody, um, and, and pathologizing what might be normal um, exploration or questioning or understanding um, by labeling something as OCD inappropriately. We want to be really careful, of course, to understand the level of safety in the client's environment to determine whether exposure could be helpful. And we want to be thoughtful about um, if we have particular indications that exposures could be iatrogenic, right? If somebody becomes highly physically aggressive or homicidal when they experience anxiety, we might slow our role on exposure or not do it at all um, in favor of some other intervention strategies. Okay, so those are our case conceptualization driven deferrals or contraindications, which are the things that sort of at a broader treatment level, these are the decisions that we might be thinking about a treatment plan. Let's say then you have a kid that you're like, okay, I'm doing exposure, I'm following exposure protocol. Um, I'm going into my session and on my agenda, I plan to do an exposure. You also might have what we call accountable justification driven deferrals, which is basically like I am making a decision in a given session not to do an exposure that I plan to for X, Y, Z reason. So I'm choosing to defer the exposure till later because it's not appropriate for this specific session. Um, again, these are sometimes tricky and unclear, but some clear reasons why you might choose to not do exposure or to change a plan away from exposure is if you learn that basic needs aren't being met, right? You get an outright refusal to participate. There's new symptoms reported where you're like, whoa, wait, maybe this wasn't an obsession. Maybe this is a hallucination, right? I need to get more information. If you have concerns that a given exposure would end up being harmful, identifying a safety concern or something comes up or emergent life event where you need to deviate and select another technique. Again, knowing how easy it is for us as clinicians to not do exposure, we just want to make sure that we have a good justification for deferring an exposure that was planned. And it should be clear enough that you can document convincingly, like, this is a very clear reason why I'm not using exposure. So this is the accountable justification driven deferral. And then finally, we have our planned augmentations, right? So this is when we are pretty confident that exposure is a part of the treatment protocol, but we also need to figure out how we'll augment or adapt the actual exposure practice itself to address what's going on within the individual child. And that's what I'll sort of focus on in the last few minutes that I have with you today. So, and so examples here to think about what we'll talk about a little bit more, <clears throat> excuse me is, for example, you may adjust how much you use cognitive restructuring depending on how cognitively minded a child is or what the role of catastrophic cognitions are within their avoidance patterns. Um, we'll talk about the role of relaxation um, and how to apply it in an opposite action framework, talk about when and how we might think about optimizing the use of mindfulness strategies, um, and then when we might incorporate distress tolerance skills, which can be particularly important and relevant if an exposure ends up being too hard and runs the risk of leading to either self-injurious behaviors or suicidal ideation. So as we think about how to augment the core steps of exposure, those five steps that I talked about in the first half of the hour, um, I propose some guiding questions for, 
clinicians that you can use in collaboration with children and their caregivers to guide exposure practice and integrate other evidence-based practice techniques as needed. So the three questions that you wanna ask yourself before doing any exposure practice is what is it that my client is afraid of, right? Understanding that core fear. Is that fear leading to maladaptive avoidance? And what does my client need to learn to overcome this fear? And how can I design and implement exposure tasks to help them learn that to the fullest extent possible. So in this is an area where we, in thinking about these questions, we need to also check our own biases about what does and doesn't constitute maladaptive avoidance. Um, to give a very overly simplistic example, like I have a fear of heights, so I have a tendency to minimize like other people's fear of heights and be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. You shouldn't want to go up that high or climb that ladder or go rock climbing that because it's super scary, right? But like, that's my own anxious bias sort of coloring how I'm viewing what's maladaptive potentially for another individual. Um, conversely, we might think that a child needs to overcome a specific social fear that a child just doesn't perceive as impairing at all. Um, and this is, I think, particularly salient as we uh, loosen restrictions around COVID and what somebody thinks of as still maladaptive avoidance and healthy anxiety compared to somebody else's level of risk tolerance can be quite wide and variable. Um, and this is an area then we're being really collaborative with the family and working to understand their goals and values can really help determine whether you should target something through exposure or not. And once you've identified your targets for exposures, in many cases, those four subsequent steps of exposures that we talked about earlier, psychoed, assessment hierarchy building, tailor practice, and homework and relapse prevention, oftentimes that can be sufficient to support youth in overcoming their anxiety. However, for kids with more complex presentations, augmenting exposure practices with other evidence-based interventions is often helpful. So I'm gonna cover now a few of the most common augmentations that we see in clinical practice with the caveat that this is probably in no way exclusive. And again, an hour to cover a lot of this is um, really tip of the iceberg. So I'll start with cognitive restructuring. Um, you may have noticed that when I presented exposure earlier, there was not a big emphasis at all on engaging in cognitive restructuring, right? Very little talk about identifying anxious thoughts or thinking traps or engaging in evaluation of thoughts. And that's because in general, it may not actually be necessary to support kids. And in some cases can actually serve to lengthen the time of treatment for symptoms to become less impairing. And I wish I could remember who to attribute this to because I take zero, zero credit for the phrase, but you can sum up this principle with the idea that in a traditional exposure model based in like CBT, right? Cognitive and behavioral therapy. If you do the B, like the behavior, you will get the C for free. So in other words, if you do support youth to engage in exposure practice, the youth will engage in learning that will actually facilitate the cognitive changes that you might see with more traditional cognitive restructuring. And along these same lines, if you do too much cognitive restructuring prior to an exposure, kids can lose out on an opportunity to learn through practice that feared outcomes either may not come true or that they can handle more than they expected they would. And in my own practice, I think, I think about this a little bit like I'm doing a cognitive sandwich. Like prior to the exposure, I'm working to understand the anxiety a youth is experiencing and what they're afraid of. And then after the exposure is over, we engage in post-processing to solidify the same content that we might have identified if we did something akin to traditional cognitive restructuring like detective thinking. That said, that doesn't work for every kid. So there's a question, like how do you know when you should do more traditional cognitive restructuring versus not? Um, so, because in contrast to doing the B to get the C for free, sometimes you may actually need to do the C to be able to get the B, right? So for example, intense anxiety that leads to outright refusal to engage in exposure practice can be a sign that you might need to do some more traditional cognitive restructuring for to take steps towards um, engaging in approach behaviors. Um, in addition, if there's really clear cognitive distortions essential to presentation, like they have very high threat overestimation that's really clearly driving avoidance, integrating more traditional um, cognitive restructuring prior 
to an exposure can be really helpful. So for example, if you're hearing the kid be like, oh no, no, I can't be in a room with the dog. It's definitely gonna bite me. And you have this like cute little chihuahua that's very unlikely to bite. Like you might need to do some cognitive restructuring about how do we know when a dog is dangerous? What are warning signs a dog might bite? And that can sort of be required in some cases with kids to get them to be able to execute the exposure practice. <clears throat> So the next sort of common augmentation is the use of distraction or distress tolerance. So like in general, right, um, we try to minimize distraction or use of safety behaviors in the context of exposure practice. And we really want kids to really fully engage visually or cognitively with whatever the stimulus is that we're doing. Um, and the idea being the more we can get them engaged, the more learning they'll do, the better the outcomes. Um, but there are times where it may be appropriate or really even necessary to incorporate distraction or distress tolerance. Um, so for example, exposures can be particularly challenging for kids with attention challenges, like kids with ADHD who may struggle with sustaining attention. Um, and sometimes if you um, engage, like giving them a little bit of a fidget toy to focus on what they're doing can be a step along the hierarchy to be able to get them to move along. So we can incorporate distraction or other distress tolerance strategies um, to be able to move people along within the context of treatment. Um, okay, I think that was everything I wanted to say about that, but I could also probably spend an hour on that one as well. Um, similarly, in a sort of very comparable sort of theoretical platform, um, using relaxation or deep breathing is generally not recommended within the context of exposure practice because it can interfere with the learning processes for the youth, right? So like they might learn, I can only do this if I take deep breaths rather than learning that they can actually handle a situation on their own. And there's some really um, clear and good data to suggest that exposure alone is effective. And if you add relaxation, you don't get anything out of it in terms of better outcomes. And in some cases you may see worse outcomes. But that being said, there are some times where relaxation can be very important or helpful. Um, one key way is, right, it, exposure doesn't work if someone's not willing to do it. So if we need to use relaxation to in, get buy-in and um, enhance acceptability and tolerability, that can be an important time that we might use relaxation. Um, if the alternative is for somebody to completely run out of the situation entirely and we can coach them to take some deep breaths and calm down, in other words, when relaxation is used to facilitate approach, that can be very useful and helpful. Um, and also particularly if you, there are some kids that we see who exhibit what I call like an anger anxious response, right? When, they're, when they encounter an anxious stimulus, they may become physically aggressive or begin yelling or screaming. I once had a kid throw a trash can at me during an exposure, right? And so from an opposite action principle, if a kid is showing sort of that aggressive or they're approaching in the context of anxious exposure, we want to help them actually take a step back and calm down. So coaching the use of relaxation or potentially grounding strategies within the context of um, the fight anxious response can be important. And then finally, I have here mindfulness is sort of asterisk because I do think it's a different construct than relaxation where we're like sort of focusing on calming the body down, whereas mindfulness is really, its goal is more to uh, focus attention to the current moment. Um, so incorporating mindfulness, especially when um, youth are experiencing a lot of rumination during the aftermath of an exposure or they're kind of stuck up in their head and not able to engage in the exposure, encouraging um, a present moment awareness and really focused attention, doing like a grounding five, four, three, two, one exercise to sort of pull them back into the moment and proceed with the exposure can be very beneficial. And then if we're encouraging deep breaths, one strategy that might be thoughtful is to focus on the breath as part of mindfulness. The goal is not necessarily to relax the body, but more to focus attention to the current moment to be able to then proceed with the exposure. I alluded to safety behaviors before, right? Safety behaviors are any behavior that serves a purpose that the youth or parent perceives as helping to lessen their own anxiety. It could be cell phones, water bottles. They could be like very overt, just like covering their eyes or more covert, like fidgeting with fingers. Um, and in general, use of safety behaviors is thought to reduce the efficacy of exposure because it interferes with the attributional learning, right? So like I can do this because I have my lucky rabbit's foot, not because I'm strong and brave and I'm able to handle 
this situation. But again, there are some times similar to relaxation or distress tolerance where to get buy-in and to move up the hierarchy, we might intentionally allow some safety behaviors in the beginning and actually incorporate pulling back on safety behaviors into the hierarchy itself to ultimately help kids reach their goals. Um, and the last sort of bucket that I'll talk about um, before hopefully turning it over to some questions, so I know I covered a lot of content, is the use of rewards, right? If we work with kids, we know rewards are important. Um, most of the treatment work will take place in the more natural setting. So the more we can reinforce brave practice outside of session, the better. Um, ideally, rewards should be appropriate and desired. Um, we wanna reward, especially for anxious kids, we wanna reward their effort and not the results, especially for kids who have more of a perfectionistic tendency. Um, we don't wanna reward them for achieving. We wanna re reward them for making effort. Um, we want to be sure to help parents really follow through on rewards and make sure that we're doing it in a feasible way and making sure rewards are not necessarily monetary or costly, but can be, you know, making a favorite dessert or getting to pick what mom makes for dinner or a lot, obviously a wide variety of different options. Um, rewards become especially important when youth are experiencing inattention or hyperactivity challenges. Um, we might reward smaller bursts of approach behavior within the context of um, youth who are, have more ADHD behaviors because we want to have shorter bursts and chunks of learning and then rewarding that brave behavior so that um, we can help them sort of optimize their uh, response. And I'll say one other thing about kids who struggle with more inattention and impulsivity that um, sometimes we see is that it can, kids who are a little bit more on the impulsive side sometimes really underestimate how hard an exposure is going to be. So they're like, yeah, I can do that. And then they do it. And then they have this sort of more extreme dysregulated response to the exposure because they didn't really think through what the consequences of the experience might be for them. And so that's another time actually where we might sort of, again, pull in some of those distress tolerance skills and pull in some cognitive restructuring, less so about like, is the thing that you're afraid of going to happen? But like, is it possible this might be harder for you than you anticipate to help kids better anticipate and prepare for what types of things may make them feel anxious versus not? It's a little bit of like when we have kids who show that impulsivity pattern, we flip a lot of our sort of basic principles on their head to be able to help kids reach their goals. And I'll just end as there's lots of reasons why exposure might not be working. We might have the wrong core fear. Kids may be sort of white knuckling their way through, just trying to get through it versus really experiencing it. Um, kids may have co-occurring disgust reactions that need to be addressed separately. Disgust doesn't typically habituate the same way anxiety does. So you may ask people to rate separately disgust ratings from anxiety ratings issues with motivation. Again, we could potentially use rewards for that or motivational interviewing. Um, kids may not be paying attention to the stimulus. There may be caregiver accommodation we're not aware of. Caregiver anxiety may need to be specifically addressed either within the context of treatment or the caregiver's own treatment. And this is not in any way an exhaustive list. This slide is mostly at this point intended to validate. This is very hard. It's very challenging. It's difficult to do this work, but it's very much worth it. And to just sum up, I, I would say exposure is a very powerful tool, It can, but it really needs to be wielded with great care and great precision. So to loop back to that conceptualization becomes so important to knowing when you should use exposure, when you should use something else, and how and when you need to pull in other tools to best improve youth outcomes. Okay, and then I hit the iceberg analogy too hard, but again, obviously this is sort of tip of the iceberg about what we could talk about. And now I hopefully saved a few minutes for questions. Wonderful. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, if anybody does have questions, you can please feel free to put them in the chat or you can just unmute yourself um, and ask directly. Yes. Um, so there's uh, definitely actually advantages to doing exposure virtually because you're in the kid's home, right? You're like with that ecological validity and sometimes like they can, you know, doing bathroom or shower exposures, they can turn the video off and do things in a way that sometimes is really tricky to sort of approximate within the therapy space. And I can send a paper, actually some colleagues and I wrote a paper specifically about tailoring telehealth exposures for social anxiety in kids. Um, and so there's a whole list of a table that actually uses the ready toolkit examples, but then talks about what the adaptations are 
for telehealth because there are some different considerations that you can use in um, within the context of telehealth exposures. But the world is your oyster with telehealth. Um, the key thing is whether kids are paying attention, right? Or like, because they can like just leave. That's the hardest part. So sometimes just having caregivers make are around to, you know, if the kid runs out the room and shuts the laptop off, um, it's a little harder to come back from that than when they're in person. But in general, it's the same. And sometimes there's just more opportunities in a way that we actually don't have in person. Um, there's really good evidence, and you know we could spend eight hours on that too. Um, but there is really good evidence that you can do exposure treatments for individuals with autism spectrum disorder. There are some general um, like differences that we might take. Is one like there's a lot less emphasis on cognitive stuff, and you want to be really like, and you have to sort of watch your style and match it to kids with um, autism. So, for example, one early mistake I made in doing that work is I tend to have a very sarcastic style and that sarcasm doesn't always land with somebody who um, may be more neurodivergent. And I fortunately had a client who was like, are you being sarcastic? Because I don't understand what you're saying. And I was like, that's, I'm so glad they were able to give that feedback, right? So there, you you know, there's some alterations we think about in that regard. Um, and then it tends to be very behavioral um, in much more behavioral than cognitive when working with individuals with autism. Sometimes we want to think about like what restricted or repetitive interests an individual might have that we can leverage for reward programs, right? So if somebody's super duper into Star Wars, like you're going to be buying Star Wars stickers to encourage uh, minimal minimization of rituals and compulsions. Um, the other piece about OCD with autism is there's a diagnostic differential there about what you'll target, right? Because it's not always clear if somebody's doing something because it's enjoyable and it's an enjoyable repetitive or ritualistic behavior versus something that's truly more compulsive. So one of the things we wanna try to assess is like, what's the function? Like, are they doing the behavior because they're trying to neutralize a feared outcome or just uncomfortable feeling or are they doing it because they like it and it's sort of like sensation seeking or pleasurable or whatever it may be and so um, we don't target the more pleasurable or enjoyable activities through ERP and there's also a little bit more about open conversations especially if it's more severe is like what are we going to accommodate what do we need to target and we sort of the parameters and expectations may be a little bit different depending on the severity of the symptoms in both conditions and again there's lots more there i'm happy to talk sideline thank you very much colin thanks to all of the hgap students who worked really hard to write the grants to make this possible and to handle all of the technical aspects of our meeting today. Um, I also want to thank NCPA for helping us with the continuing education um, component of today's presentation. And finally, thank you very much to Emily Becker Hames. This was a wonderful presentation. I learned a lot and I'm sure everyone else did too. So thank you. Thank you for having me.